The Word of God, the Holy Bible, is a treasure and a gift beyond compare. Every passage of it points to a marvelous truth that God's love for man impelled him to step out of eternity and unite with his creation in order to redeem him from sin. Jesus Christ is both the author and subject of this precious word. Join us at the Superior Word each week as we search out this wonderful gift in search of Christ Jesus. Psalm 81, to the chief musician on an instrument of Gat, a psalm of Asaph. Sing aloud to God our strength, make a joyful shout to the God of Jacob. Raise a song and strike the timbrel, the pleasant harp with the lute. Blow the trumpet at the time of the new moon, at the full moon, on our solemn feast day. For this is a statute for Israel, a law for the God of Jacob. This he established in Joseph as a testimony when he went throughout the land of Egypt, where I heard a language I did not understand. I removed his shoulder from the burden. His hands were freed from the baskets. You called in trouble and I delivered you. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. I tested you at the waters of Meribah. Selah. Hear, O my people, and I will admonish you. O Israel, if you will listen to me, there shall be no foreign god among you, nor shall you worship any foreign god. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. But my people would not heed my voice and Israel would have none of me. So I gave them over to their own stubborn heart to walk in their own counsels. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their adversaries. The haters of the Lord would pretend submission to him, but their fate would endure forever. He would have fed them also with the finest of wheat and with the honey from the rock. I would have satisfied you. Almost breaks your heart reading that. We're going to get into Deuteronomy 2 again. It's verses 24 through 37. And it says, Rise, take your journey and cross over the river Arnon. Look, I have given into your hand Sihon, the Amorite, king of Heshbon, and his land. Begin to possess it and engage him in battle. This day I will begin to put the dread and fear of you upon the nations under the whole heaven who shall hear the report of you and shall tremble and be in anguish because of you. And I sent messengers from the wilderness of Kedemot to Sihon, king of Heshbon, with words of peace, saying, let me pass through your land. I will keep strictly to the road, and I will turn neither to the right nor to the left. You shall sell me food for money that I may eat, and give me water for money that I may drink. Only let me pass through on foot, just as the descendants of Esau, who dwell in Seir, and the Moabites who dwell in Ar, did for me, until I crossed the Jordan to the land which the Lord our God is giving us. But Sihon king of Heshbon would not let us pass through for the Lord your God hardened his spirit and made his heart obstinate that he might deliver him into your hand as it is this day. And the Lord said to me, see, I have begun to give Sihon and his land over to you. Begin to possess it that you may inherit his land. Then Sihon and all his people came out against us to fight at Yahatz. And the Lord our God delivered him over to us. So we defeated him, his sons and all his people. We took all his cities at that time, and we utterly destroyed the men, women, and little ones of every city. We left none remaining. We took only the livestock as plunder for ourselves with the spoil of the cities which we took from Aror, which is on the bank of the river Arnon, and from the city that is in the ravine as far as Gilead. There was not one city too strong for us. The Lord our God delivered all to us. Only you did not go near the land of the people of Ammon, anywhere along the river Jabok or to the cities of the mountains or wherever the Lord our God had forbidden us. The account here is parallel to that found in Numbers 21. If you want to understand it fully, you have to go back and watch that particular set of sermons for this and the next sermon in particular. The two really have to be taken together to get a full view of what is going on. And for the most part, that is what will be presented today. When something needs to be compared to or aligned with the earlier story of Sihon, it will be laid out for you in that way. Here we have a real battle that actually took place about 3,400 years ago, and yet it anticipates another actual battle that hasn't even happened yet in human history. But along with that is the fact that these stories have parallels to our own battles in life. 
I'm not one, as you know, to make extended moral applications out of these passages, but it just cannot be overlooked that there are spiritual and moral parallels to what occurs in our own lives. For example, Israel is going to battle against a foe. It is a foe who is on the offensive in this particular battle, and Israel will respond to his aggression as it comes. Once attacked, though, we are not only assured of the victory, as Israel was, but we are also able to go on our own offensive engagements, just as Israel was. We are the Lord's people, and we have been provided both defensive and offensive weapons, and we have the ability to destroy what the enemy has built. Our text verse comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 10. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Paul speaks of pulling down strongholds. That is an offensive type of warfare. He also speaks of casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself. Those, likewise, are offensive maneuvers. What Israel does in these verses in a physical realm very well mirrors the things that we are to do as outlined by Paul. As I said, moral and spiritual applications of such things are not my main focus, but they do have their place. In any given passage from the Old Testament, one can often find one of four main uses for it in that passage. This is known as the quadriga, a literal and historical account, a moral application, a prophetic application, and a pictorial application, meaning something that pictures something else. As you read the Bible, it is always interesting to think on how these all fit into whatever you are reading. But you also have to be very careful to not over-spiritualize things in the process. Unless you, what you are looking at is actually and accurately revealed in another way, it is best to not simply make stuff up. That is counterproductive and it can lead people down unhealthy paths very quickly. In all things, be sure the word is carefully handled and you will do well. For today, we have some rather interesting prophetic and pictorial things that we will be looking into. Such interesting things are to be found in his superior word. And so let's turn to that precious word once again, and may God speak to us through his word today, and may his glorious name ever be praised. I've got, I believe, three thoughts for you today. The first is, this day I will begin, verses 24 through 26. The words here are the continued words of the Lord, which began in verse 18. Moses has been quoting him since then. Verse 24, rise, take your journey and cross over the river Arnon. As noted in Numbers 21, the Arnon is the border of Moab, between Moab and the Amorites. Upon entering this area, the final trek before leading into Canaan is seen. The name Arnon comes from Ranan. It signifies to give a jubilant, ringing cry and thus rejoicing. Therefore, this is the roaring stream. Upon crossing this river, they are no longer in a land which the Lord intends to be left alone. The inhabitants of the land they will now encounter are those noted to Abraham over 400 years earlier. Genesis 15, now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Avram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Avram, know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and they will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Now, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Abraham was promised the land of Canaan, a land where Amorites also dwelt. However, the Lord was not yet ready for them to be dispossessed. They had not done enough evil to justify their extermination. But the Lord knew that by the end of these 400 years, their iniquity would be so great that they would need to be destroyed. Therefore, the promise to Abraham was delayed until that time. Some look at the extermination of these people as a brutal and unjust act by the Hebrew people. But they failed to see that the Lord treated Israel in exactly the same manner. 
For example, when Israel's iniquity had become so great, there was eventually nothing else that could be done but allow their destruction and exile. Here's what it says. And the Lord God of their father sent warnings to them by his messengers, rising up early and sending them because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his works, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. Therefore he brought against them the king of the Chaldeans, who killed their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion on young man or virgin, on the aged or the weak. He gave them all into his hand. And all the articles from the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king and of his leaders, all these he took to Babylon." Then they burned the house of God, broke down the wall of Jerusalem, burned all its palaces with fire, and destroyed all its precious possessions. And those who escaped from the sword he carried away to Babylon, where they became servants to him and his sons, until the rule of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. As long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill seventy years." The only difference between the extermination of the Amorites and the destruction of Israel is that the Lord had made a covenant with Abraham and he had made a covenant with Israel. Despite their conduct, which was as bad and often worse than those they dispossessed, the Lord kept his covenant promises to them. No such covenant was made with the Amorites, however. Verse 24 continues, Look, I have given into your hand Sihon, the Amorite king of Heshbon, and his land. The narrative will be filled in later as to what will bring about the coming battle. For now, Moses states the words as a fact. The land is given into Israel's hand. Unfortunately for these Amorites, and unlike the others whom Israel has already encountered, there was no word of protection from the Lord for these people. The name Sihon, or Sihon, was introduced in Numbers 21.21. He is actually referred to many times in the Old Testament, even as late as the time of Jeremiah. This is because his name is directly associated with the land he rules. We do the same today when we might say this is the land of chief Red Cloud. Sihon's name comes from a root which signifies to sweep away or to strike down. Thus, his name may signify anything from tempestuous to warrior. He is defined further as Melech Heshbon Ha'emori, or King of Heshbon, the Amorite. The word Heshbon comes from Hashav, It is a word which signifies to consider, calculate, or devise. Therefore, it signifies an explanation of things and thus intelligence. Amorite comes from amar, meaning to utter or say. Therefore, the name signifies being spoken of and thus renowned. The idea with the combination of his name, title, and location is that despite his greatness as a warrior, despite the intelligence of the foe, and despite the renown of the people, Israel is assured victory. As he says, I have given. The king, meaning he and all the people and the land, is given as a possession. The time of the iniquity of the Amorites is full, and Israel is to be used as the instrument of the Lord's judgment against them. One cannot find fault in the Lord, who is the creator, and thus sovereign over his creation. He had mercy on this group of people for 400 years, And in that time, their iniquity grew to the point where there was no other remedy than their destruction. Therefore, Israel is told to, verse 24 continues, begin to possess it and engage him in battle. In verse 2-5, the word gara, or engage, was first used. It signifies to stir up, coming from a primitive root meaning to great, and thus it figuratively means to anger. Here, it means to excite oneself against another. It has been used three times to prohibit Israel from stirring up a fight. In 2.5, they were prohibited from stirring up a fight with the descendants of Esau. In 2.9, it was then seen that they were not allowed to stir up a fight with the descendants of Moab. And in 2.19, they were told to not stir up a fight with the sons of Ammon. Now, it is used for its fourth and last time in the books of Moses to do exactly the opposite. They are to actively gara, or engage the Amorites in battle for the purpose of possessing what will be dispossessed by Sihom. But there is a further reason for conducting the battle, which is outside of Canaan proper. Verse 25, this day I will begin to put the dread and fear of you upon the nations under the whole heaven. 
The reason for stating this now, rather than after the events of the actual account, which began in verse 26, is to set the stage for Israel's victories in relation to the nations of the world. It makes the fact more poignant by telling what will result, even before stating what will lead to the intended outcome. Israel is promised that a dread and fear of them will affect the nations under the whole heavens. The word is plural in the Hebrew. The New King James Version said heaven. That's incorrect. Some scholars take this as hyperbole, but what occurs here still applies today. God's covenant with Israel, their campaign for the land of promise, both outside and within the borders of Canaan, and their continued existence as a people literally permeates the entire world. Just because the event recorded here occurred thousands of years ago, it does not mean that it has any less value than it did then. Rather, because the history of Israel is recorded, and because the covenant of God with them is contained within their historical record, meaning scripture, this word has in fact gone out to all the nations under the whole heavens. It is both geographically and temporally a true statement to all, verse 25 continues, who shall hear the report of you and shall tremble and be in anguish because of you. And shall tremble and be in anguish because of you. The first word, ragaz, is used in Exodus 15 after Israel had passed through the Red Sea. The people will hear and be ragaz, be afraid. Sorrow will take hold of the inhabitants of Philistia. The second word is chul. It signifies to whirl or to dance, and thus by implication it means to writhe. It is used when waiting because there is a sense of anxiety or writhing when one waits, right? We wait for something and we're anxious about it. We're writhing, all right? It is also used when a woman gives birth. There is a travail and pain in the process. One can think of the nations of the world whirling and writhing as if waiting in anguish for a terrible outcome. The idea then is that Israel is the Lord's possession. It is through Israel that the Lord is glorified. Those who are in fear of Israel are so because they understand that it is the Lord who accomplishes his feats through them. So, it is logical to ask, as recorded in the Bible, did all of the nations tremble because of Israel? The answer is no. What about in their history and even today? Do all of the nations tremble because of Israel? No. And so is this a failed statement? The answer is no. It obviously speaks of those people and nations who understand that Israel is the Lord's possession and who accept that the Lord is God. This is the purpose of keeping Israel for all these millennia. Eventually, the nations will come to understand not only that the Lord is Israel's God, but that the Lord is God. This is what is referred to in Ezekiel. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you, speaking to his own people Israel, have profaned in their midst. Then the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes, coming soon to a worldwide calamity near you. Here in Deuteronomy, the Lord says he will begin this process. In Ezekiel, it speaks of a time when the Lord will continue this process, something that is happening in our lifetime today. Someday, the completion of this process will be realized, and all of the world will see that not only is the Lord Israel's God, but that the Lord, Jehovah, is in fact God. With that understood, the details of how this is to come about are now set to be reviewed. I have given you the victory and the battle is won. All you need to do is engage the enemy. The outcome is assured and the fight is done. Just step forward in faith and this you will see. The fear of you will be upon all who hear and none shall be able to stand against you. Whether the enemy is afar or near, just step forward in faith. It's all you need to do. The victory is assured because of Jesus, my son. In him, the battle is won. Surely the battle is through. Trust in him and the fight is done. Just step forward in faith. It's all you need to do. Our second thought today, a hardened spirit and an obstinate heart. It's verses 26 through 37. The words now go from those of the Lord to those of Moses. He will fill in the details concerning what the Lord had just spoken. Verse 26, and I sent messengers. In Numbers 21, 21, it said, and Israel sent messengers. That was the narrative form of the account. 
Moses is now recounting it from his perspective. As the leader, he directed messengers to go forth, verse 26 continues, from the wilderness of Kedemot to Sihon king of Heshbon with words of peace, saying, The wilderness of Kedemot has never been mentioned before. The name comes from Kedem or east. However, Kedem also speaks of that which is before, because the sun rises in the east. Therefore, the location means ancient times, antiquity or beginnings. It is from this newly stated location that Moses sent messengers to Sihon. And with them, they carried words of peace. Israel has already been told to destroy all the inhabitants of Canaan. That was stated explicitly in Numbers chapter 33 with these words. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you have crossed the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you, destroy all their engraved stones, destroy all their molded images, and demolish all their high places. You shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land and dwell in it, for I have given you the land to possess. Sihon is not in Canaan, and therefore he was exempt from this directive. Therefore, Moses' messengers extended words of peace from him, just as they were extended to the descendants of Esau and of Lot. Therefore, the fate of Sihon will be his own fault. For now, Moses' words of peace are, verse 27, let me pass through your land. The words are identical to Numbers 21, 22. Israel had asked because Moses had asked. He petitions the king through his messengers to simply pass through the land, but with the following guarantees. Verse 27, going on, I will keep strictly to the road, and I will turn neither to the right nor to the left. In Numbers 21, it said, we. Here, it is spoken in the first person, I will keep and I will turn. Moses gave his personal guarantee on behalf of the people. Further, he gives a strong emphasis by saying, baderek, baderek elek, by the way, by the way, I will walk. He further defines that as lo asur yamin usemol. No, I will turn right and left. Sihon is given the same strong sureties that were given to Edom as was stated in Numbers 20. Please let us pass through your country. We will not pass through fields or vineyards, nor will we drink water from wells. We will go along the king's highway. We will not turn aside to the right hand or to the left until we have passed through your territory. At that time, however, Edom refused passage to Israel. And so Israel turned and took another route. Eventually, as we will see, some of those in Edom did allow them a certain amount of passage through their land. For now, and with Sihon, Moses continues, verse 28, You shall sell me food for money, that I may eat, and give me water for money, that I may drink. Only let me pass through on foot. The offer is the same as for that of Edom. The offer is to pay with silver for anything that is eaten or for any water that they obtain from wells or springs. They further note that they are passing through on foot. In this, there is no mobilized army. Any animals would be led, not ridden on. The sureties are that there will be peace and complete compliance with the stated words. Verse 29, just as the descendants of Esau, who dwell in Seir, and the Moabites who dwell in Ar, did for me. The words here appear contradictory to both the earlier record in Numbers concerning Edom and also a later note concerning Moab. First, after their petition to Edom, the response from the king of Edom was, You shall not pass through my land, lest I come out against you with the sword. Also, later in Deuteronomy, we will read this concerning Moab. An Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter the assembly of the Lord, even to the tenth generation. None of his descendants shall enter the assembly of the Lord forever, because they did not meet you with bread and water on the road when you came out of Egypt. The first thing to consider is that this is a continuing narrative. And the second statement is contained in the same book that the verse we are looking at now is in. It would be ridiculous to think that Moses would write one thing and then to contradict himself with his own words. To resolve this, we can note first that the words here do not specifically apply to traveling through Edom, which was denied by them but rather to the willingness of Edom and Moab to sell food and water to them as Israel traveled around their borders. Secondly, in regard to Moab, the word Moses uses in Deuteronomy 23 is kadam. It signifies to come before or to meet. 
it would imply a hospitable meeting. The descendants of Lot may have been willing to allow Israel to skirt their borders, and they may have even sold them food and water for silver, but they did not voluntarily tend to their needs. As their forefathers, Abraham and Lot, were related by blood, this was an especially unfriendly act. Thus Moses codified it into the law that they should not be allowed into the assembly of the Lord for their lack of fraternal care for Israel. And finally, Moses' words here do not mention the king of any of these people. He simply notes that the people of the land sold them food and drink. Therefore, there is no contradiction in what Moses says now to anything which at first appears contradictory elsewhere. The reason why I go into such detail on that is because you will read commentaries by scholars that say that this is contradictory to this verse and this was written by a later author. It was inserted by somebody at David's time or some nonsense like that. Absolute rubbish. You have to study the words and you have to take the whole counsel of God in its context and you will see there are no errors in this precious word. But understanding what we just went through, he now says, verse 29 continues, until I cross the Jordan to the land which the Lord our God is giving us. Moses is obviously speaking for Israel and not merely of himself. He already knows that he will not pass over Jordan and into Canaan. Therefore, his words, though in the first person, are spoken of concerning Israel collectively. Despite this, the words are actually a continued note of surety to Sihon. If the Lord their God is giving them the land west of the Jordan, and as Sihon is east of the Jordan, then the Lord has not granted Sihon's land to Israel. The words are actually a careful note of security for Sihon to consider. Despite these guarantees, verse 30, but Sihon king of Heshbon would not let us pass through. The word here is different than that used in Numbers chapter 21. There it said that Sihon would not natan or give passage to Israel. Here it says he is not abba or willing to allow passage. The change is purposeful in order to set up the next words. Verse 30 continues, For the Lord your God hardened his spirit. Before I give you any more comments, do you remember that Pharaoh's spirit was hardened? I'm going to mention that in a second. Yeah. And many, many scholars say that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, and that's proof that we cannot call on God. And all of this New Testament theology that says we do not have free will and that God overrides our free will and all of that kind of nonsense. And when we went through the Pharaoh's sermons, it was very carefully structured. Different words were used for hardened. And it showed very clearly that the hardening was... Well, I'm looking for a specific word. It begins with P and ends with passive. Is passive, Yes. Here is a verse which we're looking at now, which is similar to that of Exodus concerning Pharaoh, and which uses the same word, kasha, or harden. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart to multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. The word signifies to be hard, harsh, or severe. Moses says that the Lord made his spirit hard, but further, verse 30 continues, and made his heart obstinate. The word here is ametz. It signifies to be strong, bold, and courageous. It is the same word used later by Moses when he tells Israel to be strong and courageous. Likewise, the Lord says the same thing to Joshua to encourage him once Moses dies. Rather than saying his heart is obstinate, I would translate this like strengthened or encouraged. The obvious question to consider, just as with Pharaoh in Exodus, which we went through every time, these two different words that God was using, he was showing us something. Did the Lord actively harden his spirit and encourage his heart, meaning purposefully override Sihon's nature, and thus bring about the change? The answer is no. Sihon saw how Israel had traveled around Edom and Moab, not through them. Thus, it was obvious that they had not granted access to Israel through their lands. Sihon would have seen the passivity of Israel in this, and so he assumed they were unable to fight in such a battle. Everybody see that? The same is true with Ammon, as was seen in verse 219. The trek to Canaan could have been immensely shorter if they had gone through their lands, but they did not. Therefore, Sihon's spirit was passively hardened, and his heart was passively encouraged. I can whoop these people. Further, as an Amorite, this next one is a most important point. He was kin to the Amorites on the other side of the Jordan. Therefore, his spirit would have been hardened against Israel because of this as well. 
The very fact that Moses said to him that it was the land which the Lord our God is giving us would bring exactly the opposite effect that it was supposedly intended to have. We don't want your land because Canaan is giving it to us became in this guy's mind the land the Lord our God is giving us is the land that the Amorites' gods will be expelled from. The hardening was passive and yet it was completely effective. This is so, verse 30 continues, that he might deliver him into your hand as it is this day. Isn't this exciting? When you get into the words, you understand theology, and all of a sudden the New Testament doesn't say what you thought it said because some scholar says you don't have free will in your salvation. When that's the premise from the very first page of the Bible where man is introduced is that we are given free will. If you don't understand that, go back and watch some of the earlier Bible studies that we did on that particular issue or the early Genesis sermons, free to will or not free to will, and you'll understand what God is doing in human history. He does not override human beings as we seem to infer from many teachers that say these things. Anyway, verse 30 continues, that he might deliver him into your hand as it is this day. The word is lema'an. We simply say so or that but it signifies to an end purpose. The process of doing the things that have been done was purposeful. Nothing was left to chance and Sihon's reaction to it was assured. And yet, and despite this, Sihon is solely to blame for what occurred. Based on this, verse 31, and the Lord said to me, see, I have begun to give Sihon and his land over to you. The Lord, having directed all things to meet a determined outcome, now states that outcome which has been derived from his divine causality. I have begun to give signifies that it is done. The initiation of the process has begun, and the hardening and the encouraging have met their intended goal. Therefore, verse 31 continues, begin to possess it that you may inherit his land. As in verse 24, it is an imperative. You are to take this action. However, in verse 24, it shows how it will come about. In this verse, the stated outcome is given. This is seen by putting the two side by side. The first one in verse 24, begin to possess it and engage him in battle. And then here in 31, begin to possess it that you may inherit it. The same word, yarash, is used in both verses, but it is repeated in the second one. It speaks of inheritance. In other words, one could say, begin to inherit it that you may inherit it. The battle is merely a stepping stone on a path that leads to a guaranteed outcome. Because the land is an inheritance, important point, it belongs to Israel. Verse 32, then Sihon and all his people came out against us to fight at Jahaz. The name Jahaz or Yahatz comes from a root meaning to stamp. Thus it signifies trodden down. The name of the place is probably derived from what occurred during the battle. At this location, the Amorites were trodden down. And thus Israel gave the location its name as a memorial of what occurred. It is Sihon who initiates the action. Israel has not moved from the wilderness, as is seen from the Numbers account, Numbers 21, 23, but Sihon would not allow Israel to pass through his territory. So Sihon gathered all his people together and went out against Israel in the wilderness, and he came to Jahaz and fought against Israel. Israel had peacefully petitioned Sihon, and they had remained encamped at their place of petition. Therefore, Sihon is to blame for the aggression, and any land lost in battle by default will belong to Israel. And the outcome is, verse 33, and the Lord our God delivered him over to us. The Lord is given the credit as the principal cause. He is ultimately responsible for the victory, and without him, the victory would not have come about. Sihon was delivered to Israel by the Lord so that Israel could accomplish the Lord's purposes as is stated next. Verse 33 continues, so we defeated him, his sons, and all his people. Israel is the instrumental cause of Sihon's defeat. Because the Lord delivered him, so Israel was enabled to defeat him. And the victory was complete, as it says, him, his sons, and all his people. At times in the Hebrew, there is a difference between the written text and that which is read. When they read it aloud, they do not read what is actually in the written text. This is the case here with this particular verse. The written text says his son. That margin note, however, says his son's. Either way, whether one son or more died in the battle, even if he had more sons, it makes no real difference. 
This is because, verse 34, we took all his cities at that time. Verse 31 said that Sihon and all his people came out against us. The implication is all, all, all the fighting men. In doing this, he left open the possibility of total defeat. In such a case, there would be no battle-capable men to defend the cities. Thus, Israel would have been able to take all of the cities with relative ease. Sihon's overconfidence left his people in a very bad state. Verse 34 continues, And we utterly destroyed the men, women, and little ones of every city. We left none remaining. The word translated as utterly destroyed is a word we've seen before and we'll see many more times. It is haram. It comes from a primitive root signifying to devote to religious uses. In such a case, it signifies a devotion to God, meaning that nothing would be spared, but all would be devoted to the Lord. In this, the implication is that the slaying of these people is by divine direction. As he is the judge of all souls, and as all things belong to him, what Israel does here is with the extermination of even who we would call innocents in a regular war, cannot be considered either murder or some type of war crime. As the Lord is God, and because Israel is the Lord's arm of judgment, their actions are wholly acceptable. But this cannot be said in any other scenario in human history. As there is only one God, then all other gods are false. Thus, the actions of those who randomly take innocent life cannot be condoned, even while the actions of Israel, as directed by the Lord, cannot be be condemned. Despite the mandate for haram of the people, however, the cities were not destroyed. And more, verse 35, we took only the livestock as plunder for ourselves with the spoil of the cities which we took. The act of haram at times extends to all things, including the livestock and the spoil of the cities. This is the case, for example, with Jericho. Nothing, absolutely not one thing, was to be taken from Jericho. This is true at other times, such as with the Amalekites, as is recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 15. The decision was the Lord's, and each instance is based upon his will, not the desires of the people. Therefore, the act of haram is as much a test of obedience to Israel as it is a point of authority of the Lord over Israel. If you know what I'm talking about, they disobeyed at Jericho, and it cost them. Saul disobeyed Samuel, and it cost him. The Lord is the one that decides, and it is a test of obedience. Israel devoted to the Lord that which the Lord determined to be devoted, and they were also provided for from their battles according to the decision of the Lord. Verse 36, from Aror, which is on the bank of the river, are known, and from the city that is in the ravine as far as Gilead. Aror means stripped, bare, or naked. It is noted as being on the bank of the Arnon. It rested on the north bank of the Arnon River. The next boundary is noted as a city in the ravine. That is probably Ar of Moab, which is noted in Numbers 21.15. By naming Aror and not naming Ar, it is showing that Aror at least partially belonged to Israel, while Ar, though forming a border, still belonged to Moab. The middle of the river itself, however, is the border between the two lands. From that border, all of the land was taken as far as Gilead. In the Hebrew, there is an article before Gilead. It says, the Gilead, and thus it surely speaks of Mount Gilead. The name Gilead means perpetual fountain. All of the land and all of the cities within the land were taken. As it says, verse 36 going on, there was not one city too strong for us. Here is a new word, sagav. It comes from a primitive root, meaning to be lofty and thus inaccessible. Therefore, it is better translated as not one city was too high for us. We could paraphrase that by saying no city was out of our reach. It is this word that brought to mind the text verse today where Paul spoke of every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Moses is rejoicing in his words over a physical conflict that really took place, and Paul's word rejoice over the spiritual equivalent which we face as believers today. Both are obstacles on the road to the land of promise, and both are only defeated in one way. For the church today and for Israel of the past, that is, verse 36 continues, the Lord our God delivered all to us. Though we are given weapons of war, be they physical or spiritual, apart from God, there can be no victory. Remember our reading here today about Stonewell Jackson? He understood that. 
But with him, all strongholds will be cast down and every high thing is brought low. It is he who ultimately delivers the enemy and grants his people the victory. Verse 37 finishes with, Only you did not go near the land of the people of Ammon, anywhere along the river Jabok, or to the cities of the mountains, or wherever the Lord our God had forbidden us. The Jabok, or Yabok, means pouring out. It is the designated border of the land. In this, it is another note of obedience by Israel. They refrained from securing any land that belonged to Ammon, the descendants of Lot. Here it says, along the river Jabok. The Jabok was the border between the two lands. And so Israel stopped at that point. However, in Joshua 13, it will say this concerning the inheritance of the land given to Gad. Their territory was Jezer and all the cities of Gilead and half of the land of the Ammonites as far as Aror, which is before Rabbah. This land comes into dispute in Judges chapter 11. However, that was land which was won in battle by Sihon. It first belonged to those people. Sihon got it from them. When Israel defeated Sihon, that land became a part of Israel's possession. Ammon lost their claim to it when it was lost to Sihon. Everybody see that? If I go to battle and I defeat somebody, that's my land. Okay, and then somebody comes and defeats me, that land becomes their land, not the land of the people who previously got it. And we're going to find out about that when we get to the book of Joshua and Judges. Everything else which still belonged to Ammon at that time was left to them as the Lord commanded, as well as all the other land prohibited by the Lord. The borders remained set by the Lord alone. The spoil is yours with the battle over and done. The enemy is destroyed and you can now rest. You trusted in Christ Jesus, my precious son. You had faith in him and you passed the test. In this battle, you have the victory and the spoil is there waiting for you. The rewards of heaven are yours, heaped up a plenty because you trusted in Jesus who is faithful and true. Great are you, O God, and greatly are you to be praised. We honor you for all you have done. With hearts of joy and voices loudly raised, we worship you through Christ Jesus, your son. Our third thought today is prophetic pictures. The subject of Sihon has already been presented in Numbers chapter 21. There it was seen that he prefigured the Antichrist. His name means warrior, something identified with the Antichrist. He is here called the king of Heshbon, or intelligence. His destruction here in a physical battle is equated to what Paul says of such things in a spiritual sense in 1 Corinthians, where it says this, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. The Antichrist is the king of that which is opposed to God. There is the wisdom of God, and there is that which is opposed to him, meaning false wisdom. The first notable thing is that Moses sent his message from Kedemot, or as we saw, ancient times. That is reflective of the word of the Lord, issuing forth from eternity itself. The Lord uses Kedem, the root of Kedemot, in this manner in the book of Isaiah. Here's what it says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, which is Kedem, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. It is a note of surety that what the Lord has ordained will come to pass. As we saw, despite it being a request for passage through the land, the request was actually the means of hardening Sihon's heart to affect the purposes of the Lord. That is exactly what has been purposed for the Antichrist from the very beginning. And so Israel proposes to go through his land to the land of promise, exactly what will happen in Israel's future. But that is denied by him. However, as we saw, the Lord purposed for this to come about. The spirit of the Antichrist and thus the Antichrist must be destroyed. And the Lord purposed that it will come to pass. As we saw in Numbers and is repeated here, The place of the battle is at Jahaz, which means trodden down. This is what will happen to Jerusalem, as is noted in Revelation 19. The holy city will be trodden underfoot. However, Israel will prevail in the end, and they will take possession of Sihon's land. What belonged to the Antichrist and his master, the devil, is regained for Israel. 
at that time, it says that they have inherited the land from the Aror on the Arnon to the Jabok and even as far as the Gilead. Aror means stripped, bare, or naked. That is referring to the state of all things before the Lord. From Hebrews 4, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Our known comes from Ranan, as we saw. It signifies to give a jubilant, ringing cry and thus rejoicing. The Yabuk or Jabuk means pouring out. There is a pouring out of God's favor, love, grace, mercy, and the like, even the Holy Spirit on Israel coming soon to a day near us. But there is also a pouring out of God's wrath on the Antichrist. And Gilead, or perpetual fountain, speaks of the state of Israel from that point on. They will have the perpetual fountain of God flowing forth for them from that time on. The narrative today is both in line with the account in Numbers 21, and it also expands upon it, adding in new details through new names and places. It is a note of confirmation that God's promises to Israel will not fail. And though they must face this foe in the end times, the Lord will be with them, bring them through what is coming, and bring them to the place that he has promised their fathers thousands of years before. That is what makes all of this so astonishing to me, is that these things actually are perfectly pictured in Israel's history and what the Bible says is coming in their history, both Old Testament and New. We see this, and that's what makes it so astonishing that everything that Moses wrote has further applications. Yes, it has a moral application. Yes, it has a prophetic application. Yes, it has a pictorial application and a spiritual application. We have all of these things going on from a simple narrative. It is astonishing that people can come and type sermons about this from this particular book or this chapter and have a thousand different sermons and they all ring true because people are approaching it from a different way. I choose this way. Some people approach a moral application and say, well, don't do this because and don't do that because I'm not here to teach you that. I'll do that in the New Testament studies and then you can learn that on your own by knowing the word of God on your own. The faithfulness of God to Israel is the sure sign of the faithfulness of God to us in Jesus Christ. He made a covenant with Israel, which he has never forsaken and which he will never forsake. And in the giving of the new covenant in Christ, the same reliable surety is found for us. God can't be trusted to follow through with his promises even when we fall short. Thank God for that. So have confidence in this and trust that what God has promised in Christ will be brought to its happy conclusion. Thank God for Jesus Christ. I've got a closing verse for you from Psalm 37. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. What a wonderful Lord. He is so good to us. Next week, we've got Deuteronomy 3. It's verses 1 through 11. Another foe, another battle, someone to whoop up on. It's entitled, The Defeat of Og, King of Bashan. That'll be our ninth Deuteronomy sermon. And it'll follow as this sermon did today. It'll follow as it did in Numbers 21. You have the Antichrist, well, you have somebody else that needs to be destroyed before Israel enters into the inheritance. We'll see that next week. Okay, I've got a question for you. All right. The Antichrist is going to come from what people group, and where is that found in the Old Testament? What people group? Romans, that's correct. He's going to be a Roman. Where is that found? Revelation. Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Actually, it's in the 27th verse, but you read the whole thing and it'll let you know he will be a Roman. The prince of the people who is to come. The wording is very peculiar because the Romans destroyed the temple, but that wasn't the Antichrist. The one to come is coming much, much later actually in our future yet. Okay, bonus question. Antichrist is defined by which apostle and how does he define it? Which apostle defines Antichrist? John, John is correct. Revelation. It's, no, John is correct. 
I can't believe you guys don't know this because we've been going through the book of 1 John in our daily commentaries. We're in 1 John 4 right now. He defines it and where is it found? It's in 1 John chapter 2 and it's found in 1 John chapter 4 and also in 2 John 1 7. He defines it as denying the son's relationship to the father. In other words, denying that Jesus Christ is God. Anytime you deny Jesus Christ is fully God, you are antichrist. That's why the Jehovah's Witnesses have no salvation. They say that we believe in Jesus. We believe he's our savior. And yet they deny that he is the son, meaning God incarnate. And therefore it is antichrist. The Mormons do that. The Muslims do that. Anybody that denies the father-son relationship of Jesus Christ, that he came in the flesh, is antichrist. And this person will be the epitome of that. He will deny that, and he will come and make the agreement with the Jews. Why? Because they already don't believe it. And so he's going to say that's not true, and blah, 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 and he's not the, the son of the father, he's not God, and he's, they're going to sign this thing. And it's going to take them through seven years of hell on earth. And two-thirds of them, according to the book of Zechariah, are going to be extinguished because of their faithlessness. But God will protect the other third. He will carry them through, and they will enter into the millennium because God is ever faithful to his unfaithful people. You and me in the new covenant, the Jews of the old covenant. And until those seven years are done, the old covenant is not complete for them, but it is for us because we are in Christ. Good stuff. The Lord has you exactly where he wants you. He has a good plan and a purpose for you, but he also has expectations for you as he prepares you for entrance into his land of promise. And so follow him and trust him and he will do marvelous things for you and through you, okay? Got a short poem, and we'll be done and take communion. The defeat of Sihon, king of Heshbon. Rise, take your journey, and cross over the river Arnon. Look, I have given into your hand Sihon the Amorite, king of Heshbon, and his land. Begin to possess it and engage him in battle. His defeat will be grand. This day I will begin to put the dread and fear of you upon the nations under the whole heaven, so I shall do, who will hear the report of you and shall tremble and be in anguish because of you. And I sent messengers from the wilderness of Kedemot to Sihon, king of Heshbon, with words of peace, saying, Let me pass through your land. I will keep strictly to the road. I will turn neither to the right nor to the left, so I was relaying. You shall sell me food for money that I may eat, and give me water for money that I may drink. Only let me pass through on foot. That's my proposition. What do you think? Just as the descendants of Esau who dwelt in Seir and the Moabites who dwell in Ar did for me until I crossed the Jordan to the land which the Lord our God is giving us, this is my plea. But Sihon king of Heshbon would not let us pass through for the Lord your God his spirit hardened like clay and made his heart obstinate that he might deliver him into your hand as it is this day. And the Lord said to me, see I have begun to give Sihon and his land over to you, begin to possess it that you may inherit his land so you shall do. Then Sihon and all his people came out against us to fight at Jahaz. This he did do, and the Lord our God delivered him over to us. So we defeated him, his sons, and all his people too. We took all his cities at that time, and we utterly destroyed the victory we were gaining, the men, women, and little ones of every city. We left none remaining. We took only the livestock as plunder for ourselves with the spoil of the cities which we took, from Aurora, which is on the bank of the river Arnon, and from the city that is in the ravine that is in the brook. As far as Gilead, there was not one city too strong for us. The Lord our God delivered all to us. We had no fuss. Only you did not go near the land of the people of Ammon. Anywhere along the river Jabok, you did not trod, or to the cities of the mountains, or wherever had forbidden us, the Lord our God. Lord God, turn our hearts to be obedient to your word. Give us wisdom to be ever faithful to you. May we carefully heed each thing we have heard. Yes, Lord God, may our hearts be faithful and true, and we shall be content and satisfied in you alone. We will follow you as we sing our songs of praise. Hallelujah to you, to us, your path you have shown. Hallelujah. We shall sing to you for all of our days. Hallelujah and amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful story of redemption and faithfulness on your part and also mercy even on people like the Amorites because you gave them 400 years to amend their ways and yet they didn't and their iniquity became so great that they were like the people before the flood and their time had come to be exterminated and Lord God we certainly see that attitude in the world today and how gracious and merciful you are that you don't just snuff us out as a people and 
well, we'll keep that one to ourselves, Lord, but we, we certainly do ask that we would humble ourselves in this nation and turn to you and uh, just put you first in all things. May it be so, and if not, surely judgment is due. We love you. We, we praise you for who you are and for what you do, and we do all of this in the beautiful and exalted name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Uh, as you come up, any lady here that's a mom, unfortunately Beth isn't here today. I was hoping she'd come by, and Mary Jo, she has to stay home, and Pat. But any uh, of our ladies that are here that are mothers, I got a flower for you. Please take at least one. And uh, let me take that off now. I didn't want flying all over the place. So, Okay, yeah, that's, that's a Mother's Day for you guys. Anyway, uh, we get the instruction for the Lord's Supper directly from Scripture. And that's from Paul's hand where he wrote these words, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And he would have blessed this bread. He would have said, Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And he broke it and he said, Take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, and he would have blessed this as well. He would have said, Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam borei pari hagafen. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You get one too, and then you get more when you go home. <laughs> and you get this. Oh, Happy wow. Mother's Day to you. Or that one, you just grab one because there's, there's another mother coming too. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Amen. Christ. Amen. Close the stick it. Yeah, oh yeah, you got to be careful with that one. These, these got some thorns in them. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't poke okay. yourself. Uh -oh. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Make sure you grab one of these when you leave today, okay? And I guess it's pretty. They're all pretty. I'm not going to look because then I'll be like feeling guilty if one of them is. I'm just going to grab the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't poke yourself. If he's not fully man and fully, that's what you the spirit of the Antichrist. You, that? you ask him that. that? Is he God? He is. You passed mm -hmm. the test. Yep. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Charlie. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. I get to watch uh, once a week, you got Sergio, my friend in Israel, and the other guy that I walked from Jericho to Jerusalem with was Yossi, and some of you have met him, he's been here, but uh, Yossi, um, uh, he uh, is a translator at a church in Israel. His dad is the pastor, speaks Russian, then he translates in Hebrew. And it's so marvelous to see, you know, it's just, so I thought we'd add him and their congregation into prayer today too, so you know who I'm praying about. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Father, thank you for the many blessings of this life. Thank you for the week that's gone by and the safety you've given us, and thank you for the week ahead. We anticipate good things, but if they shouldn't come, please uh, just keep us with enough strength to praise you, and with that, we will be satisfied. And we certainly pray for Yossi and his father over in Israel and Rhoda and her father who has uh, his own church over there and any other decent Christian faithful congregation in Israel that's uh, uh, worshiping you, that you would give them strength and uh, build them up because it is more and more difficult for them in these times. And uh, we would just pray that they would, like the churches in America, be able to meet and be able to fellowship together and may that day be soon, and even after this is over, may their congregations increase because of their online ministry. We pray this, that you will be glorified in them, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.